honor and glory. We yes. welcome, welcome, welcome you, Holy Ghost. Yes. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So let's take a, I'm going to take a seat today. I, I got so comfortable sitting like this with the answer it course. I said, we should just preach like this all the time. <laughs> you know, you just sit down and you lean on it, right? <laughs> and um, and so anyway, it's back. And I'm sure my husband's going to be like, you sat down? I sure did. Sure did. Um, so I, I want to start off, you know, I normally start off with something that I've read because generally um, people, people have, that know God better than us, know God better than us. Amen? Amen. And there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> so you don't go into your prayer time or into your fellowship with God trying to get, wring something new out of him. Like, give me something ain't nobody said. <laughs> I, no. I, <laughs> give me something that you want to say Amen. because you've been saying the same things Amen. since the very beginning. Amen. Right? And so it's no different here. So I've got something from Amy Simple McPherson. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but in this particular vision, she talks about um, God com coming to her and saying, there's more in store for my people. How come they won't partake? How come they won't go ahead and give themselves wholly to it so that I can give them everything that I've ever intended to give them? And so I'm just going to start mid-sentence. This is the Lord talking to her. Then he said unto me, why have my people stopped small mountain of blessings? I, even I, have come to lead them forth to my great mountain, from weakness to strength, from defeat to victory, from showers, because, you know, we get like little sparse showers sometimes in our lives, but to torrents, meaning it's a constant flow. Hallelujah. Amen. Right? Amen. That bowls you over. <laughs> Stuff you can't even contain. Amen. Oh from the brooks to the rivers. Oh, why have my people not gone on to fullness? I have said greater things than I do, shall ye do, because I go to my Father. Speak unto my people, cry out, leaving the things that are behind, let us press on to perfection. Pressing on to perfection. And that's what I wanna talk a little bit about today. Because he goes on to say in this vision that she had, that he's waiting for a yielded, Posture. I'm going to have to figure this mic out, aren't I? My husband's going to be like, that's why I should have came. That's why I should have came. Anyway, what about, what about, what about? We good? All right. <laughs> I'm gonna like, just like this. I ain't going to move. <laughs> no. um, but he's waiting for a yielded people, and he's wanting to see yielded hearts. And I think one of the things that, if we be honest about our society, isn't that the one thing we lack? I mean, just overall as a culture, yes. and I'm not just saying this because it's Pride Month. I'm saying it because generally speaking, we're full of pride, Amen. right? And we're unwilling oftentimes to self-reflect and do the work. I mean, people will go to counseling and, and do their darndest to find a counselor that agrees with them just so that they can say they went to counseling. <laughs> right? I'm going to counseling. I'm doing my work with somebody that's just amen and everything you think about yourself. <laughs> that ain't work. Amen. Right? That's just an alibi. Yeah. And so it's important that we understand that as he's coming for us, he's expecting fruit. Right? He's expecting fruit. And there's never, there's never wasted time in inspecting your own fruit making, your own fruit bearing. Easy to look at somebody else's fruit, right? Because we all know how to inspect other people's fruit. Yeah. Oh, your fruit is lacking. Ooh, it's spotty. Ooh, it's rotted. But when we get over to our side of the fence, oh, yeah, it looks good. Yeah, I ain't got no issues, right? I love God. <laughs> I go to church. I pray, right? Are the boxes to be checked as opposed to allowing the Holy Spirit to unearth things that, like I said, if, if allowed to lay dormant, just continue to suppress everything that he wants done in your life. So you, you, you sit there for 20 years and you don't know why you've not really made any progress with God. Doesn't mean that you're not um, serving or attending church or any of those things, but there should be an upward incline for every child of God from faith to faith, amen? amen. And if you're not moving from faith to faith, then this is what you're doing. You're regressing. 
And I know it doesn't mean I feel that way, <laughs> but you are, because there's no sitting still, right? There's no pause button when it comes to walking with Jesus. He didn't say, okay, well, we can pause right there, and we'll let you sit there for about 10 years, and I'll come back and visit you and see if you want to make progress a little later. No, we're either keeping pace with grace or we're falling behind, all right? So let's jump into this. As I, as I kind of mentioned in my prayer, one of the things that kind of got this discussion started for me with the Lord was this idea that it's just, it's minor adjustments that make such a, a tremendous difference in our lives, right? I, I always liken it to sports because sports is an easy thing to talk about, but it's as simple as for a pitcher lining up the threads of a baseball, right? Or of a quarterback lining up the threads of that football. He takes that football any other kind of way and tries to throw that ball, he's gonna have uh, some problems, right? But if he catches it on the laces and he follows his mechanics, he's probably gonna be successful 75, 80% of, of the time, right? If he catches the ball any kind of way and just says, I'm just gonna throw it, well, he's gonna have some problems. He's gonna have some issues. And it's the same thing for us. And so I found this definition, it's called the concept of marginal gains. And it's used primarily in business, but they say it's the idea that focusing on tiny improvements in different areas will add up over time and make your overall process stronger, your overall growth and development stronger. So minor adjustments over time cause us to grow and develop and get where we're trying to go, right? We focus sometimes on major adjustments, right? We have to have knockdown, drag out times with the Lord where he just knocks us over the head and we're like, okay, Lord, I surrender it. When really it's minor adjustments, not just in the way that I see people, but in the way that I see myself, right? That when I wake up in the morning and I look at myself in the mirror, I'm pleased with the product. Not from an aesthetic position, right? Not from a, my hair's where I want it to be, my, my skin's, my skin's flow. It's not about that. It's that when I wake up in the morning, I look in the mirror, I see his reflection, right? And, I'm, and I know I'm not an imposter. Because we know when we're in pop. Come on now. We know when we're faking it, right? We know when uh, you ain't serious about that. That's not real. Uh, and conversely, God knows that too. And so I just want you to keep that in the back of your mind, this concept of marginal gains. It's the, it's the idea that we focus on tiny improvements, uh, we take hold of our life and we focus on these tiny improvements so that we can have greater gains. And isn't that what, what we do even with our children when we teach them? We don't ask our kids to go from first grade to sixth, right? It's marginal, small improvements over time that add up into growth and development and make them the person that we pray that they're going to become, right? And again, I always say this, but, but God is no different. He's, he's, a much, he's a much better father and he does the same thing for us, that there are, there are things over time that he's like, let's go ahead and address that. Let's unearth that. Let's deal with that. Yeah, well, let's go ahead and do it today. Like, why are we waiting, right? We don't need a special service. I don't need to go to a women's conference. I don't need nothing like that. I can do that right here in my home between me and Jesus. And I can say, I'm not taking this anymore, Amen. right? When I look in the mirror, I'm not going to shoulder this anymore. And that's where we're trying to get to as people of God because it's right and because we're needed. You're needed. You're needed. And if you're not willing to ever address it, you don't ever meet the need, right? And he's waiting on us, all of us. And I, I say this all the time, but it's not about your position in the church. It's not about being behind this pulpit. It's not about any of that. It's about being a reflection of who he truly is every single day, Amen. right? No fig leaves, no facades, no nothing, just me and Jesus. Amen. That when you see me, you see him, right? And if I miss out on something or if, I, if I'm wanting in something, I'm quick to repent, right? I'm quick to repent and address it. Because as a child of God, I don't sit there and try to count my faults. I say, Lord, let me know my faults so that I can correct these things. Amen right? So that I can be who you want me to be. So we're go so going on to perfection and courage uh, to confront the sacred cows of our lives. How many people know there are sacred cows in our lives, things that, that we hold very dear to, that we don't want any, anybody touching or 
You, and you know what those are, right? They're touchy subjects. If you're married, your spouse knows your sacred cows. And when they touch it, you bristle. I don't even want to talk about it. I don't even talk about it, yeah, right? That's our response to those things because we hold them dearly. And what happens is it causes a disconnect, not just in marriage, it's not just in the home, but even amongst one another, right? There are places in fellowship that we'll never reach with each other because of those sacred cows that we sit by and we pet and we say, no, no, I just can't. I'm not ever going to be open. I'm not ever going to be transparent. I'm not ever going to really connect beyond that surface level because I love my cow, right? But how many of you guys know that oftentimes it's the people, well, not just oftentimes, it's the way God has worked it, right, Elder, that people are called to pour into our lives, right? So, and I'm guilty of this. I'm not preaching to you something that I haven't had to look in the mirror for myself and say, um, why don't you want to connect? Why do you want to stay on the outskirts? Why are you better on the periphery? Why is that a comfortable place, right? Um, I was, <laughs> well, I, I kind of mentioned this to Aaron, and my best friend knows this about me, that I'm terrible at, at reaching out and phone calls, right? Terrible. It's just bad. And, you know, my best friend has suffered through it, but she's very gregarious. I mean, God gave me the, the best best friend for me because she's somebody that will just kick down the wall and be like, what you doing? Where you at? How come? Why didn't you? Okay, friend, my bad, right? Make me feel bad. Now I got to call you. Wait a minute, let me put this on my calendar. Let me call this child. Because if I don't, we are done forever, right? My, my mom knows. My mom is my best friend, and, and she's, a, she's a hoot. But, but what I'm saying is those things that, that we've become very comfortable with, there's, there's, there's a reason behind that, right? And I could say, oh, it's because I'm an only child, because that's an easy one. I'm just an only child. You know, I'm used to doing me. I don't, I don't really need nobody, you know. It's not that. It's just that connection requires you to exchange. And oftentimes, you're not always sure that what you exchange is going to be what? Amen. Right? So it's better to sit back and say, I exchange nothing at all. <laughs> right? And you never get to reject me, and I get to Look, I love everybody from over here. <laughs> right? And that's so easy to say. I love, it. I love everybody. Just let me sit over here. Um, to learn, again, secret cows. That's mine. That's one of mine. I, I don't plan on giving all my secret cows away today. Uh, <laughs> but if it should come up, I'll be, I'll be willing to share, okay? Um, but I don't think this is that kind of meeting, right? I don't think so. Um, but 1 John 5.21, he says, look yourselves from idols. I'm going to have to move to the handheld. Uh, little children, keep yourselves from idols. That's the New King James Version. This is 1 John 5, 21. In uh, the New Living Translation, it says, Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. And then in the ASV, the American Standard, he says, My little children, guard yourselves from idols. Because idols are nothing more than fancy alibis. Right? Dressed up, we've made them real pretty. We got a real good reason for why we feel that way, why we're concrete in our belief, and we expect everybody to respect that. And if you don't respect that, you don't respect my boundaries. Nah, it ain't people disrespecting your boundaries. It's just that you keep inching closer to my sacred cow, and I want to keep it, right? And your interaction with me, um, the things that I unveil to you, could allow you to see into some things that I'm not willing to confront and to change. And so as a result, I keep you here. Oh yeah, I see you at church. I see you at church, but don't call me. <laughs> okay, pray for me if I ask, but do not call me, right? And we have to ask ourselves why within the body of Christ, we have um, friends outside of the church that are, that are closer to us, um, of greater influence to us, and yet, when we look around in the body, especially when we come to women's ministries and things, we can't point to one person that we say, I would call you if I was in a pinch. Right? I would call you. I would call you even if I wasn't in a pinch. I would call you just to say, hey, how you doing? Ruth knows. Ruth will call me. And I'd be like, Ruth, why are you calling me? Just text. <laughs> she don't know that, but she does now. <laughs> 
<laughs> she didn't know it, but she know it now. And Ruth be like, y'all be writing too much in them text messages. <laughs> So, so, so the, the saints who are like, call me, do not write me a book. And then the other saints are like, I'm writing a book because I do not want to call. I do not want to call. I do not want to call. So let me make this two, three messages, and then I'll wait. Then I hit you again in about 30 minutes, and I give you the other part. Because I don't want to seem needy. Um, but, that's, but, but honestly, think about that, that in a women's ministry, and in a, in a culture, in a church culture, that has been predominantly female, when you think about it that way, right? Because we, women get a lot of praise for keeping the church afloat and holding the church together. Okay, that's fine, that's true. But, but what fellowship, what, what brotherhood has been the result of that, right? What can we show from that? That there's really a divine connection between you and I. And that doesn't mean I'm not saying that everybody in your church should be your bestie and that we need to have one big group me where we all tell our business so that everybody can be on the same page. We're all transparent. No, not at all. What I'm saying is that there should be at least one sister in the room that knows me better than others, right? Amen. And what I'm also saying is that I should be willing, listen, I should be willing to love on and to befriend somebody that knows God better than I do and not be intimidated. Irrespective of their age, irrespective of their stage, meaning if they're married or unmarried or whatever, there are people in the world, I know, newsflash, there are people in the world that know God better than you. And the only way that you get to knowing God better for yourself is by saying, I'm going to link up with that person. Isn't that what Elisha did with Elijah? He said, oh, I'm going to follow this man. Right? Once he got that coat, he got that mantle, he said, oh, I'm not letting this go. Amen. There's an anointing here. There's something for me. There's a deposit that I have to have in my life. And it's no different for us. But what happens? Fear. Right? Intimidation. Right? Because we love comparison. She's so pretty. She's so much prettier than I am. Oh, she's married. I'm not married. I don't want to. Uh, no, if you're not married, you ought to have a married friend, right? A girl, I'm not talking about you hanging out with her and her husband on, on the boat. I'm saying, <laughs> I'm saying, <laughs> I got to clarify these things, okay? Because y'all know the world. Y'all know the world. I'm saying, I'm saying that I have a married friend that I can call and she pours into me from a place of knowing where I'm trying to go. I don't understand singles who say they want to be married, and the only people they want to talk to is other singles. You're going to be single and by yourself, because that's the cycle. You single, I'm single. We single, they single. Okay? You got to break the pattern. I'm single, you're married. I'd like to know all about it. Right? I'd like to know some things so that I can grow into the person I need to be so that one day I too can be married. And so, okay, let's, let's keep going. So I want to go to Genesis. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to read this. Sorry, I don't have it up on the screens for those of you that, that didn't bring your, your Bibles or, or anything. But it says, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, hath God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And we all know that, obviously, the, the devil is very good at semantics, right? Has God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Well, we know he didn't say every tree. He told her there was one tree, right? And so even the woman says to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. She says, now, let me clarify. But the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And at first when I read this, I thought, why is she adding to the work of the Lord? He didn't say you shall not touch it. See why she adding? Yeah. But then I thought about it from, a, from another point of view that, that maybe it was a safeguard, yeah. right? That we shouldn't touch it because touching leads to eating yeah. and eating leads to falling, yeah. Yeah. right? I tell my kids this all the time. There's a joke because I don't know if y'all used to watch uh, Raven. What, what was Raven's show? Anyway, I was watching it one day with my kids, all right? It was years ago. And, and yeah, and, and Raven says, 
um, she tells her kids, she's getting ready to leave them in the house, and she says, and no hugging. And they said, they said why no hugging? She said, because it always leads to fighting. <laughs> and I said, as a parent, I get that now. I didn't get, I, she's so right, yeah. right? That our kids, they, they hug each other, they love each other. Next thing you know, they get off me, leave me alone. You push me, you step on my toe, you yeah. blah, blah, blah. just don't touch each other, yeah. right? <laughs> just six feet, let's go back to COVID, six feet. This is what she's saying here, right? That if I touch that fruit, I'm getting into a situation where I'm probably gonna partake of that fruit, right? And once I partake of that fruit, I know that, that, it's, that it's imminent, right? That my fall is there. And she does it anyway, but praise the Lord, she had the right idea. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Isn't it amazing how he, Satan always wants to try to tell you what you're going to be. You notice that? He always comes with a voice of do this, because when you do this, you're going to be that. Yes. When he's not able to make you any of what he tells you you're going to be, except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I'll give you a position. I'll give you prominence, just like he tempted Jesus. Right? I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. But you got to bow down. Yeah. You definitely got to serve me for the rest of your days. Yeah. Right? So there's always that trade-off with him. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, was pleasant to the eyes to make one wise. I'm not going to be able to do this. Um, she took of it of its fruit and she ate. She also gave her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Notice this back up in verse four. Then the servant said to the woman, you will not surely die. You know that word surely means die. So he basically told her, you're not going to die, die. I mean, that's how I see him saying it, right? Like, you're not going to die, die. You know, it might be a little death, but it ain't going to be like a lot of death, right? And so just go ahead and eat it. You'll be fine. Uh, but I just thought that was funny. Like, why is he surely die, die, die? I mean, it, it's the same word. So anyway, when the woman saw that the food was what? She said it was good for food. She said it was pleasant to her eye. And she said it was desired to make her wise. Interesting, right? And so I want to dive into those three things because I think it gives some insight into us as women and some of the proclivities and the issues that we find ourselves in. Not because we don't have instances where we are taken advantage of, abuse, misuse, those things are real and those things happen. But as sure as those things happen is as sure as the blood of Jesus has provided the salve, right? To pull us out of those things, deliver us from those things, and give us newness of life. And so we, we can't discount the blood because of stuff we've gone through, right? Those are those sacred cows and those alibis that we love to hold on to. I would be nice, I would be nice to my husband, but my previous relationship that I had, the man that I was with, you know, he, he talked very poorly to me. But that's not the man you're with. So you can't frame your world around something that happened Right? Forgetting those things that are forget, for, forgetting. <laughs> and it's difficult, but you got to forget. Right? And this is the responsibility for all of us. And what I'm saying is those, those things that, that kind of leave an imprint in our lives along the way are some of the fa same things that prevent us from connecting to one another, prevent us from giving room to being loved and being seen. And don't you know that's what everybody wants? Right? We want to be seen, we want to be loved. Right? Not just simply in a romantic relationship, that's important, but also, like I said, just between one another. That when you see me, you see me. And I don't feel judged, and I don't feel as though you, you're, you're trying to get something from me or work an angle, but that we're just, we're just simply exchanging from a very pure place. Okay these good for food right and, and my, my initial thought was that well, what you need more food for she got every tree in the garden y'all <laughs> I mean like why we need more food <laughs> but but isn't that as women one of the things that we can say sometimes we're, we're guilty of we have a proclivity sometimes to want to hoard things we want more things of the things that we already have and we're not satisfied with that which we've already procured because there's more to be gotten even if it's more of the same, right? 
because we can think of a thousand things that we could use those things for, right? And I'm not just talking about hoarders, but I'm talking about even emotionally. Your husband could give you um, affirmation and it's still not enough. You need more affirmation, right? Your children can respect you and you still want more deference and more respect because I don't feel like that's enough. And that's kind of Eve in this situation, right? Because she's got plenty of food. <laughs> we got every tree, all right? The garden is popping off all kind of fruit. So why am I feeling like it's good for food is something that would move me to break the commandment of God? Unless there's something on the inside of me that says, I got to grasp for more. I need more of that, right? And then pleasant to the eyes. We know that as women, we're concerned about beauty, aesthetics, all of those things, right? We care very deeply about what we wear, what we look like, and that's all wonderful. Presentation is important, right? So I'm not saying anybody should not be presentable. Uh, can I just take a little rabbit trail here and say we need to, especially oh, us as older women, look at me calling myself older. <laughs> Come on, Minister May, you see that? <laughs> Boy, I dropped that and kept rolling. <laughs> but as older, um, that we take some of these young women aside and say, I don't want to see you show up at Walmart with no pajama pants on another day in your life. Okay? Those things are indicative of what? How they see themselves. Yeah, that's not cultural. That ain't me, I'm being cool, you know, that's what we do. We go hair bonnet and I'm good. No, sis. Yourself. Right? Because if I had a value ascribed to my person, if I felt like I was somebody, then I would present myself as somebody. And I would want you to see me. And I'd want you to um, appreciate my presence in a room, as opposed to me putting on something that basically says, don't look at me. I'm not very important. I'm not going anywhere special. Yeah, that's what it communicates to me. I don't know what it communicates to y'all. But it basically says to me, I really don't care. My life is a mess. Now, you can say, I just got up and I'm just trying to run in the store. Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> no. No. Because along the way, it could have just been so simple, right? Ponytail, pair of jeans, T-shirt, praise the Lord, I'm dressed. Okay? So that's just a, that don't cost you nothing. I just want to throw that out there. But pleasant to the eyes, beauty, aesthetic, presentation, we care about these things. And desirable to make one wise. Why was she concerned about being made wise? I tell you why, because as women, we're always looking for what, saints? Advantage. Oh, yeah, we are. Oh, yeah, we are. We're looking for advantage. And if we're not careful, we'll walk in our marriage with the same attitude, trying to take advantage of our husband, trying to manipulate and move him to do something we want him to do, right? And we got all the tools. I cook, I clean, right? I got the bedroom, that's me too, right? I can decide to or I can decide not until you do what I want you to do, right? Advantage. And as women, we have to be honest about the fact that we have a penchant. We, have, we just do. We have a penchant to want to take the advantage. You see it especially in our culture now, emotionally. I mean, look at our court systems. I was thinking about this. Think about court systems that allow women to go into court, not have a job, and demand that that man pays child support. Demand it. Like, you're going to take care of these kids. Well, it didn't, it wasn't just one person who, right? I mean, can I get an amen? It wasn't just one person. So, so there ought to be a certain level of want to on the part of that woman that says, I love my children. I take care of them whether you could or not. I don't let the court system determine that I don't have to pay anything. And I just say, well, you make sure you get that $700 to me every month. No. Well, I'm just being real, saints. I'm just being real. Because as women, we have allowed these things to seep into our psyche, and, our, and it's all, almost a part of womenese. Like, nobody takes issue with it. We're like, oh, oh, that's fine. Yeah, girl, get, take him to court. Get everything you can. Meanwhile, you ain't doing nothing. No. Those are your kids. You do your part. You do your part. And if you do your part, then God can do his part. But God can't do his part because you don't want to do your part. But you got a lot to say about that man. See, these are things that we don't want to talk about as women. Amen. But that's real, right? And these things are impediments to our growth and development in Jesus because you can't praise over that. Amen. That's good. Yeah? 
You can come up here and you can ask Elder Greer for prayer all day and she can lay her hands and, and agree with you. But if you're sitting up there being obstinate, doing the complete opposite of what God's word says, which says if a man don't work, and that's man universal, that amen. amen. Come on now. Amen. That's man universal. If a man isn't working, they ain't eating. So as a woman, you don't get the right to put your feet up and, and demand bonbons. Amen. Feed me, love me, have you, keep me. Amen. I mean, I'm amazed at this stuff, y'all. I go on YouTube and I watch the wonder this culture is by themselves. Amen. Amen. To be so ate up with yourself, to have all these things that you want somebody to provide for you. If he's not making six figures, if he don't have, if he's not six foot tall, if he's not, who are you? <laughs> Who are you? I mean, thank you. Amen. You don't bring six figures. You don't even work. <laughs> like you're not working. And you're like, yeah, I want six figures. He's got to have six figures. He's got to be, no, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. But see, all of this comes out of, a, out of a, a psyche that's built on this thing right here, desirable to make one wise. How can I figure out how to take an advantage? And once I take that advantage, I'm cemented therein, right? And now I leverage everything. I leverage sympathy. I leverage emotion. I leverage my weakness as the weaker sex. And now, because that man is the stronger sex, he's automatically wrong. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. You don't get to sit there and berate him and talk about him like a dog. And then if he says, woman, sit down. Oh, he, yo, oh, he, oh, oh. Nah, he should have told you to sit down. You need to sit down. Amen. Oh, I'm just being real with you guys. Because again, like I said, we've created a culture where people can come to church and they can praise over it, they can pray over it, they can serve over it, and then they're mad at God because God hadn't done something for them Amen. that they're not willing to excavate from their ground. Amen. 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 That's good. You got to. Yeah. And so the word of God comes to do what? To penetrate where we live. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Joint and marrow. Right? Right? Soul and spirit. This thing is coming to cut up some things, to remove some things, to give me some clarity about my life. Amen. Now, that's on the men's side, but it happens in friendship too, right? I don't like so-and-so, so I don't know why you're over there talking to so-and-so. Oh, we act like this stuff only happens in junior high. No, it don't. Oh, no, it don't. People be petty patties for the rest of their lives. Amen. Leveraging, leveraging, leveraging everything they can to take advantage. Right? You should sympathize with me because I'm the victim. I'm the person who needs. Now, you can't be both victim and victor in Christ. Right? That's called being double-minded. And what does the word say? Amen. Unstable in all. In all. <laughs> Not just compartmentalized into a few things, but in all your ways. You are unstable. Yeah. And you should expect what? Nothing. <laughs> so why are you sitting up there expecting stuff from God? He told you, you're not getting a dime. Amen. Yeah, he said, this ain't, this ain't child support court. This is, this, you're not getting a dime. Amen. Until you do what I've asked you to do. Amen. And it's why, as women, we can't allow these things to sit and fester and pet them and act like it's okay. It's not okay. Not to say that we don't have relapses and issues or, you know, I had a, 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 maybe a, an interaction with somebody and I was like, I could have fixed that. I could have done that better. Right? That happens. But I'm talking about, you know, being concrete in such a way where it's a way of life for you. You expect people, no, she's going to have to apologize to me. Oh, no, no. I'm not, you know what? I'm not even going to that church no more. I'm not even going to go there. No, no, no saints. We have to do the work that he requires. Amen. Which means even if it puts me at a disadvantage, I'm going to do from, from what it looks like on the outside, right? It may look like it puts me at a disadvantage to apologize or even to ignore, to love around it, but I'm doing what my father told me to do. So I'm never at a disadvantage if I'm doing what he said, Amen. right? And I embrace that. All right, here we go. So 1 John 2, 15 through 16, um, do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, 
the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Doesn't that sound a lot like what, what Eve had? Right? She saw it was good for food. That's the lust of the flesh. Right? I want to be satiated and make sure I have more. The lust of the eyes. It looks like it's good for food. I really like it. Aesthetically, it looks pleasing, right? I want to blow up. I want to be big. I want to have a business. I want to have a, a husband and 2.5 kids, and we're going to you know, be well-known around the world for our, uh, <laughs> all, all of our philanthropy and everything that we do. And how we're going to get there, I don't know, but it's going to happen because I'm a merry right. Hmm, interesting. Um, and then the pride of life, our unwillingness to deal with the fact that we miss it that we get things wrong, that we're not always right, that oftentimes we did have um, ulterior motives to what we said or what we did. We knew it when we said it. Right. We'd never be honest to the person that we were trying to play the game on, but, but we knew it when we said it. Right. These are things that we have to be willing to confront. And like I said, it makes us uncomfortable at times, but it's true. And the minute that we're able to confront these things, now we welcome the Holy Spirit to help saying that we have an issue that needs to be addressed and now let me help you address it right and then we don't bristle at that correction whenever it comes we're quick to say oh holy ghost I'm sorry what do you need me to do right it's not always that he's gonna make you go and apologize I mean oftentimes he does but sometimes it's just simply about you making a course correction that says I'm never gonna do that again I'm never gonna do that again never gonna go that way again Okay, so the other thing I wanted to point out, though, was also that she gave it to Adam to eat. One of the things that we've heard in society is that women, uh, it's a man's world, that women are at a disadvantage, that men run it all. But when you think about it, women really are the influencers, right? We move society forward. You want to know why people are up there on TikTok and everywhere else scantily clad, selling themselves on OnlyFans and everything else? Because as women, we hold the keys to sex, yeah. right? If you put your clothes on, what would that man do? <laughs> if we all just, we're not doing any of that. We're going to stay fully clothed. We're going to walk with dignity. We're not going to do any of that until we're married. We're going to, what would happen? Those men would have to conform, right? But they don't have to conform because we got women who will perform anything that, that man wants, whenever he wants, however he wants. But the influence is ours. So this idea that men rule the world and women are at a disadvantage and my, 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 it's just patently untrue. It's just untrue, guys. I mean, at the end of the day, do you know that advertisers spend all of their dollars looking for your eye? Why? Because we're the ones who will go get it. You know that truck that's out there? Who went and got that truck? This girl. Oh, pastor, pastor, pastor. Let me just, let me tell you what I found. Can I get a yes on that, brother? Can I get a yes? I, I want us to be in agreement. Not, I mean, I really don't care if we're in agreement or not. But I want us to be in agreement so I can say we was in agreement <laughs> and I can get my vehicle. I'm just being real. But at the end of the day, as women, that's the influence and the power that we hold. Right? It's the unspoken thing that we won't ever give real credence to. But at the end of the day, we as women dictate for men how the world works. Because we hold what they hold, what they want, right? Not only just in the sexual sense, but in the procreation, Amen. right? If he wants to extend his name, he's got to, where else he going? <laughs> right? So we hold the purse strings. But yet we've, we find a society that's so loose and so irregulated and, and just, I mean, women that are just, ah. And then we wonder why men treat us with such disdain, why they don't open doors anymore, why those things don't happen. That's not a bad man. That man's looking out at the culture and saying, wait a minute, you want me to, to do all that? But I can do that and get everything for free. <laughs> so why would I do that? when I can do that. But then when we find good men, 
we want to go back to them and act like, no, we still want to run the house. We want to rule the roost. We want to tell them how the cow's going to eat the cabbage. We don't want to be quiet. We want to talk first. We want him to be quiet. Henry, just sit in that corner and be quiet. We'll be ready to go here in a minute. We treat him like he's our kid. <laughs> and Henry's like, I know this woman just, you know. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> Oh. Oh, yeah, you do. Yeah, sometimes we feel Yeah, quick on the uptake. Dear, it's just right, it's right there. Just, just turn right, oh gosh. Just turn right there, right? Because we feel like we know. And oftentimes we do know, but that's because he gave us the gift of help, not the gift of subversion. I'm here to help you. But oftentimes, we've utilized that. We've leveraged it as, I get to take advantage of you. That brother don't know. I know everything about them finances going on. I know where the money is. I know what's going on in that account. I'm going to go over there and get that money and do what I want to do. <laughs> and he's none the wiser. That brother just living his life, going to work every day. He's like, baby, love you, love you, love you, baby, love you. We have to be honest about the ways in which we subvert God's original plan. Amen. And we have to be willing to fit in the role that he's given us, right? I'm not small, I'm not inadequate, I'm not, I'm not anything but who God has created me to be. And, and let me just say the singles, in light of marriage, there ought to be, because I know we've watched these movies, you know, I could do bad all by myself or whatever, whatever. <laughs> We've watched these movies in which, you know, women have, it wasn't that one, what was that? Maybe it was that one, where, you know, women have been with men all along. And then that man gets up one day and he says, I'm done. I'm going to get me a 20-something, right? I'm going to take the house and you've had the kids and, you know. And we feel like almost we play in our lives as though that's a reality for all women that they have to hedge against. And it causes us to be always on guard even in our own marriages, Right? We live with walls, and we build those walls 20 foot high, and we don't let anybody in because we don't want to be hurt. But the reality is, guys, that as helpers, we have to be okay with being wrong and not being appreciated. Amen. 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 I've had plenty of conversations with myself in the kitchen. If I have to come in here one more time and put these dishes, <laughs> come on, saints. Amen. There's a reason the dishwasher is right by the sink, Amen. right? For ease of deposit, you just, drop, you just drop it in there and you close it, right? And as women, can't we think of a thousand things that we do on a daily basis where we just would like a little, a little help? We'd like, we'd like our husbands or whoever, whoever we're dating to be just a little appreciative of those things that we're doing. And if we're not careful, we'll use that as a personal angst and, and a reason why I'm just, I don't even want to talk to him today. So he walks in the house, don't even know why things are icy. You know why things are icy? Because my dishwasher had to be loaded again. <laughs> and I ain't going to say that, but that's how I feel. Me for the last 30 minutes, I'm ready for you, okay? I am ready for you. Right? True story, though. True story. Because the enemy is going to sit there and tell you, you know, he could have just put that in the dishwasher. Ain't that, ain't that something? Ain't that something that he could have just put that in the dishwasher? Now, how come this trash is still sitting here? Ain't, nobody sees the trash is full. Oh, guys, I'm just talking to you about where we live. But these are the, these are the small foxes. These are the small foxes that spoil the vine. Right? Same thing with friendships. Why I got to call her all the time? Why I got to call her? In order to help people, in order to, to be a lifeline to people, we oftentimes have to do things that are unthankful. Amen. Right? Amen. Right? That may be praiseworthy, but are never appreciated. But if we're doing it as unto ourselves, that's how we get frustrated. You're not my friend no more. I don't even want to talk to her no more. I don't even text her no more. She get on my nerves. All because she never texted you. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you know, we got to think about these things, saints. We just doing stuff. We just doing stuff. Instead of saying, maybe it's because I've graduated to a higher level of communication, interaction, and fellowship that she needs to arrive at. And maybe I'm here to help her do that. 
right? But if I get frustrated and take my marbles and say, I'm going home, you know, I mean, I don't ever get a chance to be a blessing to her. And conversely, whatever the exchange was going to be, I missed out on that for myself. All right, let me hurry up. I'm not going to finish today. Um, let, me, let me hurry up. Okay, so just a couple of things. The fall gave way to sin, and, and that sin left an indelible mark on the soul of, of women. Now, that mark, though indelible, can only be removed, obviously, by the blood of Jesus. We have to give place to God's word and what he says. And we have to be doers, 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 not hearers. We can be expert hearers and never do, right? I can show up to church, I can be there faithfully, and I can be an expert at hearing. Don't ask me what I practiced, but I can tell you what I heard. And girl, it was good to me, okay? So insecurity. Here's one of the marks. Which it leads to selfishness, which leads to comparison, which leads to, com- right? Insecurity, which leads to selfishness, then to comparison, and now we're just competing, right? I'm more spiritual than you, I'm better than you, I'm, you know, I'm nicer than you, I'm putting on my nicest nice, so I can out nice you, right? So everybody knows I'm the nicest. It's like, what are we doing? <laughs> I mean, it's the games that we play. But, but, but we all can be guilty of it because it comes from a root of insecurity, right? That bristles up every once in a while and shows its head. And you're like, stuff that back down. I don't want to be insecure. And then it comes back up again. Because those things can only be eradicated when I say I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Irrespective of my place financially, um, whether I'm... My, my relational status, right? Whether I have children, whether I've born children or not. I, I get rid of all of these things that I feel like give some type of credit to my womanhood, right? And I get down to brass tacks, which is that he made me in his image and likeness. And when he made me, he called it good. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. When he made you, he called it good. He didn't say anything else about you but good. And then fear. And our fear leads to stonewalling, to blame shifting, to posturing. Don't we do that when we're fearful? We either don't let people in, we shift blame to other people, it's their fault. I could be better, I could be this, I could be that if he would, if she did. And then we posture, because there's nothing like a good facade, right? There's nothing like good facade, man. Fake it till you make it. We took hold of that. We said, yeah, I like that. I'm going to fake it till I... No, that, that didn't mean like in perpetuity. That wasn't like... A, shouldn't be a permanent, <laughs> a permanent facade. I mean, we're just talking about for the moment, right? Like when you walk into a room, you learn how to walk in and be normal. Everybody don't have that skill, right? I'm one of those people. I don't know how to be normal when I walk into a room. I'm like, should I hug you? I don't know. Hello? Hi. We'll shake. I don't know. Okay. It's all good. We don't do any of that. Right? Some of us are just awkward in that way. That's just real. And we have to be honest about that. And conversely, there are other people that we want to be like, work the room. That's my best friend, right? Walked in here right now, you would swear you knew her for 10 years. She'd be like, you too? I know that too. And I just sit there and I'm like, You don't know this person. (laughs) I don't understand why we're like, we are 15 minutes into this conversation and you still don't know this person's name. But you would act like y'all go way back. And that's just the gift that she has. But that's also why we're friends. I'm going to send her this tape because it's hilarious. Um, (laughs) Because that's why we're friends. Because she pulls that out of me and she trains me and teaches me how to be better in that area. Right? And conversely, I train her how to have some boundaries, girl. Back up. <laughs> I'm the one with the rope. Like, you know, I got the Apollo cane. Like, da 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 Let's get on off the stage, honey. Let's move it on. And, and that's why we work. <laughs> it's very symbiotic. It's why we work. Um, and my husband would attest to this. So last one, ambition. Ambition leads us to supplanting, preferring oneself over others, and using leverage in whatever form it, it comes, right? When we are ambitious, 
it's amazing what we can ignore in the word of God because our ambition causes us to put on blinders and say, it's okay, because my ambition is to be X. And because I want to be X, it's okay if I step on A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way to X, <laughs> okay? And I have a good reason for it. Or preferring myself over others, right? Women who have a story more pitiful than their own children, <laughs> right? I mean, they'll sit there and act like those kids owe them something. It's like your children were, they didn't decide to come here. <laughs> what do they owe you aside from respect? At the end of the day, that's all your children respect. Beyond that, leave them alone. Stop acting like kids should just be so deferential in every single thing. That, that comes, honor comes as a result of a life well lived. Amen. That they've watched you walk out some things. And over time, their eyes are unveiled to what is true and what is good. And they say, man, my mom was a blessing. Not because you twisted their arm and say, you say your mama's a blessing. <laughs> when you get on that TV screen, you say, hi, mom. Like, what is all that? Stop that. Let your children be themselves. They are individuals. They are not appendages. And they're not for your, for your personal use to, again, uh, move forward your plans, your ambitions. That's why you meddle too much in people's marriages. You get involved in stuff that you ain't got no business. Leave people's homes alone. Amen. Right? Amen. Stop calling them about what their spouse is doing or what they're cooking or what they should have been doing. They don't cook what you cook. <laughs> right? That's why I'm always at my mama's house. I tell my husband, it's a blessing <laughs> that the Jacksons are here. <laughs> You've eaten better in the last year and a half. You want to act like it's on me? Like, you should be thanking me. <laughs> I did him a great service, okay? I did him a great service. And I just want my kudos. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Look, my mom knows I will get in that kitchen quick and clean up. Let me clean up because I want the next meal. <laughs> so I will remove all impediments. What pans do you need washed today? <laughs> Hallelujah. And I love you for that, mama. But if we're not watchful, here we go, I'm gonna close this up. If we're not watchful, we can become adept at leveraging unhappiness. Our discontentedness becomes the leverage. And then no one can ever make you happy. Doesn't matter what that man does, doesn't matter what your children do, doesn't matter what that friend does, there's a constant unhappiness about your person. And you love it because it keeps you safe from ever having to deal with anything concerning you, right? It's the great protection. How come you don't do? Uh, y'all just, uh-uh, y'all not gonna bother me today because I know I'm right. I'm gonna sit here in my rightness and aloneness and I want everybody to respect that. No, 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 there's times when things need to be confronted. Amen. And there's times when you're not the victim, right? You're unhappy, get in line, everybody. I mean, can we not find ways to be unhappy? They didn't have my ice cream at, at Walmart, and I don't want to go to Super One. I'm unhappy, okay? <laughs> Plenty of ways that I can find myself in a place of unhappiness, but I can't try to use that as leverage against another to want to get them to defer to me, make me comfortable, make me happy, because we find ourselves in relationships that are very one-sided. And here's the thing, too, that women, we get, we get out of jail free from this because men won't say a lot. Huh? Amen. Women will tell it all. <laughs> and more some. Uh, right? They'll, they'll add on to the work of the Lord. Yes. Knowing that that stuff's not right, but they're just trying to work out their alibi and make sure everybody sees them the way they want to be seen. And a man will sit there for years and not say anything. And we think, man, that girl, you're just so patient. I mean, you just have been just such a rock. And then you come to find out everything she told you was a lie. You'd be like, I'm over. You ain't never taking your side. So anyhow, let me finish this up. But we discount people's values in relationships if they fail to make us happy, if they fail to appease us, if they fail to pet our insecurities and affirm us? Or how many people have heard this word a lot? Celebrate me. They don't celebrate me. In the words of Isaac Petrie, throw your own party. Okay? I love my pastor for that. But you better throw your own party. 
Because if you're waiting on the rest of us to get the balloons and everything, you're going to be waiting a minute. Especially people like me. Like, I'm slow on the come up. I'd be like, oh, you needed all that? <laughs> You'd be barely hanging from the vine. I'd be like, I didn't even know you needed that. Um, so you have to learn for yourself to throw your own party and not put it on other people. And we're not here to pet you. We're not here to pet you. But think about this. This is what I want you to take away from this. That the same way that we have an expectation of people to, to appease us, to make us feel better, to make us happy, is the same thing that we bring to Jesus. And we demand from him to make us feel happy, appease us, pet us, and do all of those things. And when your savior sternly looks at you and says, that's not how this goes, now you're frustrated and you're mad and you got church hurt because the enemy comes very quickly to give you a reason to be offended. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Oh, yeah, he'll come quick, quick, quick. Yeah. You'd be like, the minute you felt that way, the next Sunday you go into church and somebody says something, rubs you the wrong way, now you out of there. Yeah. yeah, that's how he works. And so I want you to remember that, the, that if we don't give attention to these things, we put ourselves in a position to be taken out by the enemy. And Jesus is left on the sidelines saying, I would love to help you, but you have to let me in. And you have to do it my way, right? And we're not ignorant of his devices. So can y'all just write these scriptures down just in your, in your time? I didn't want to keep us here uh, longer than, than necessary. Um, Psalm 107. Psalm 107, verses 10 through 16. Just in your time, I'd like for you to go back and look at these. Again, Psalm 107, verses 10 through 16. Isaiah 58, verse 9 through 12. Isaiah 58, verses 9 through 12. And the last one is Hebrews 13, 5. I just want you to see what happens when we, when we sit in darkness, a soulish soulish chains that keep us from, from being who God has called us to be. Specifically in Isaiah 58, he talks about how he's going to raise us up so that we can rebuild and restore foundations and become repairers of the breach. That's what he's looking for in us as women. That's where we come to help, right? To help repair and restore things. But we can't do that if we're still stuck on needing to be celebrated, right? Being stuck on the things that we feel like people should do to, to make us feel better. So let me read this and we'll get out of here. I want to read this about fellowship. This, this came out of uh, E.W. Kenyon's book, In His Presence. He talks about the, that there are two great objectives in, redem in redemption, uh, two great objectives in redemption. The first is relationship, and the second objective is to restore to man his lost fellowship. Now, when he talks about relationship, we're talking about the legal work that was done to bring us into sonship, right? That blood had to be spilled. Um, that Jesus came and he died, and in doing so, and raising again, he made us, gave us opportunity to be partakers, right, of the divine nature. And then he goes on to talk about fellowship, which is that this exchange that we have. Fellowship, he says, is based on righteousness. Fellowship means sharing together. Our fellowship with the Father is based upon relationship. Fellowship between husband and wife is based upon relationship. Fellowship is the one thing that makes married life beautiful, right? And he goes on to talk about how you can be legally wed, right, in, in a house and not have any fellowship. And you, you guys know this. There, there's no, I mean, what's beautiful about that? We're just roommates, right? And so he goes on, he says, it is when that man and woman are blended together into one spiritually, physically, and mentally, that is communion. That is real fellowship. We often have in our home in our home life, a limited fellowship. In the church, we have a limited fellowship with the brethren. That means we also have limited fellowship with the Father. So don't think that we can skirt around exchanging with one another and go to our Heavenly Father and he just fills us up. There's no need to fill your cup up because you're not trying to pour nothing out. You over there hoarding it, right? And so it's important that we understand this exchange. It is unlimited fellowship that brings happiness into the home. It is unlimited fellowship with the Father and with one another that brings the richest, deepest joy into the believer's life. 
And so I want to encourage you ladies today to consider where, am I, where are my hangups? Where are the walls that I have yet to, to really confront and deal with in my life? And is there someone that God has placed around me that's positioned specifically to help me with that? And if so, what stops me from engaging that person? Because he uses people, right? It's not gonna be your cat, your dog, it ain't gonna, you know, whiskers is not gonna give you a word. It's gonna be, it's gonna be someone, somebody. And you have to open yourself up to the reality that again, sometimes that person is not who you would have imagined and would have preferred, <laughs> right? Oh, she's a little goofy for me. I'm not sure that that's my type. What are we talking about? Like, if the person is being put around you for the purpose of in, um, increasing you and, and taking you up to another level, what does where that person comes from, right? Like I said, culturally, whether they have a, the relational status that you have, wherever and whatever it is, I just want you guys to open your hearts to that. And I think if we do that, you'll find that maybe some of the, um, the ruts that we've found ourselves in, they, they, they get unstuck. And we're able to move forward in God. Because like I said, it's micro adjustments. It's not major things. He's already, if you're in this church, he's called you here for a reason. So there's people around you already that are called to be a blessing to you and to support you and vice versa, because it's about exchange, okay? All right, I love you t on today. I thank you guys so very much for, for coming. Um, we're gonna pray and then we're gonna give away all of these gifts, because I'm not taking any of them home, amen? Father, thank you so very much for your word. We thank you for the word being sown and planted we're gonna, be, we're gonna be those that tend it and keep it. We accept it, hallelujah. We know that it is true. And those areas of our lives that need to be, um, that need to be inspected, that need to be confronted, we'll do that, Lord. We'll take the responsibility alongside the Holy Ghost and we're not gonna allow fear or insecurity or any type of, of, of wantonness in ourselves to keep us from being open to the direction and the leading of the Holy Ghost. We know that the Holy Ghost has what's best in mind for us. And so, Father, we receive your best with joy because we know that it only gets better. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.